In 1967, American forces in South Vietnam launched a series of powerful attacks on the Vietnamese communist guerrillas. The aim was to take the war to the NLF's biggest units by attacking their bases in overwhelming strength. The Americans hoped that the guerrillas would stand and fight. They could then annihilate them with vastly superior firepower. The offensives were designed to use the tactics of search and destroy on the grandest scale yet. Some of the biggest helicopter operations of the war were mounted to try and trap entire Viet Cong regiments. More guns and aircraft were called in to support the attacks than had ever been unleashed on a Vietnam battlefield. The Americans meant to damage the Viet Cong so badly, they would be unable to carry on the war. In fact, the Americans would fail to wipe out the Viet Cong's biggest units. Despite heavy losses in men and equipment, the guerrillas would return even stronger, ready to launch their own offensive campaign. mid-1965, the mission of American troops in South Vietnam was changing fast. They had come to secure air bases, but now they were actively looking for combat with the Viet Cong. On May 18, 1965, the 173rd Airborne Brigade, the first U.S. Army infantry unit to arrive in Vietnam, began operations. The first task was to sweep a wide area around its base near Saigon. The 173rd met no real resistance. There were thousands of Viet Cong troops in the Saigon area, but they remained elusive. more American troops arrived. As the weeks went on, questions were asked about the whole policy. Was it wise to send a conventional army with its slow-moving, heavily armed infantry, its planes, its tanks, against guerrilla units that might be impossible to pin down? The U.S. commander in Vietnam, General William C. Westmoreland, insisted that the army could find and beat the enemy. There were soon encouraging signs. In August 1965, in Operation Starlight, U.S. Marines surrounded a Viet Cong regiment of 2,000 men and defeated them in a full-scale battle. The next major challenge was posed by the NLF's allies, the professional troops of the North Vietnamese Army. By September 1965, two North Vietnamese Army regiments, the 32nd and the 33rd had moved down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and infiltrated from Cambodia into South Vietnam. The 66th Regiment was following close behind. 
The plan was to take the provincial capital, Plai Ku, and advance along Highway 19 to the coast at Kinan, splitting the south in two. The Americans were determined to block the NVA's attempt to reach Kina. The idea was to place in the Anke Valley the most mobile force they possessed, the 1st Air Cavalry Division. The Air Cavalry was the first formation anywhere in the world designed around the helicopter. The division was 15,000 strong and had 480 machines, five times the number of a normal infantry division. The whole idea had, until recently, been an experiment with an eye to any future war in Europe. No one really knew how it would work in a place like Vietnam. Combat units of the 1st Cavalry began to arrive at An Khe in mid-September 1965. By October, the division was fully operational. Its base, Camp Radcliffe, had grown into a massive complex of helicopter pads, supply dumps, accommodation and maintenance facilities. For the officers and men of the Air Cavalry, there was a great deal to prove, and they were determined to take the battle to the enemy. For their part, North Vietnamese Army commanders were just as keen for a fight as the Americans. Their 6,000 troops, already in the border area, meant to keep up the pressure on South Vietnamese government forces. At the same time, they aimed to find out how well U.S. troops would fight and how their own soldiers would cope with American weapons and tactics. After infiltrating into the south, the 32nd and the 33rd North Vietnamese regiments had established a base area on the high ground of the Chupong Massif. On October 20th, 1965, the 33rd Regiment laid siege to an American Special Forces camp at Plai Mai. After a siege that lasted six days, the South Vietnamese Army backed by the U.S. Air Cavalry, secured that camp, and both NVA regiments withdrew to the Chu Pong. There, they meant to join with the newly arrived 66th Regiment before renewing their campaign. The American plan was to fly in the whole of the 1st Battalion of the 7th Cavalry to find the NVA regiments. It was the first time U.S. troops would face NVA regulars. The first step was to create an artillery fire support base near the Chu Pong at Landing Zone Falcon. Next, the lead elements of the 1st Battalion landed at LZ X-Ray. Right in front of them were nearly all the 66th and 33rd NVA regiments. When Company B pushed towards the spur of the Chu Pong, it was attacked immediately, and a platoon was encircled. Company A was also pinned down by fierce fire before the rest of the 1st Battalion was landed. A and B companies then launched attacks to relieve the encircled platoon, but were driven back. 
The following morning, the Americans, reinforced by another company, were hit by waves of NVA troops. Heavy fire support wreaked havoc on the attackers, and by now, another American battalion was on its way overland. Conceding defeat, the shattered North Vietnamese regiments began to pull back towards the Yitrang Valley in the safety of Cambodia. After the fight at LZ X-Ray, the Chu Pong was bombed by almost 100 B-52s, each unloading 17 tons of high explosives. For the next 10 days, the NVA regiments were pursued relentlessly by the Americans. But although the North Vietnamese were in retreat, they were still capable of hitting back. In one textbook ambush, mounted by a rearguard battalion of the 66th Regiment, 155 Americans were killed. For US forces, it was the most costly day of the war so far. In the Battle of the Idrang Valley in the Ply Ku operation, the 1st Cavalry Division lost 300 dead. But the NVA had suffered much worse. 1,300 North Vietnamese soldiers had been killed and many more wounded. It was a clear-cut victory for the Americans. Two enemy regiments were all but smashed, and there was now little danger of South Vietnam being cut in two. The Idrang battle was a major boost for U.S. commanders. It seemed to prove their strategy was the right one. The enemy's big units could be made to stand and fight and take heavy casualties in the process. If the communists could be forced into more battles like Idrang, they would quickly suffer such losses they would have to abandon their whole campaign. The final push to use American combat forces in South Vietnam had come from President Lyndon Johnson himself. Yet, he had never wanted to fight a war in Asia. Johnson's priority was social reform, his Great Society program, and he feared the war in Vietnam might fatally damage his plans. The problem for Johnson was that if the war grew unpopular, it could cost him the political support his program needed. On the other hand, if Vietnam was lost to communism, it would be just as damaging. The only solution that Johnson could see, and the one agreed with his defense secretary, Robert McNamara, was an uneasy compromise. The U.S. would carry on fighting the war, but everything possible would be done to limit its impact on the American people. Dramatic measures like calling up the reserves or the National Guard had to be avoided. Above all, Johnson was determined to keep China and the Soviet Union out of the conflict in Vietnam. By now, both communist powers had nuclear weapons, and China had almost unlimited manpower. 
fighting the Chinese in Asia would demand millions of American troops and cost untold casualties. Johnson's solution was to fight a limited war. He restricted the bombing campaign against North Vietnam to personally approved targets. He also ruled out invading the North, no matter how much it backed the NLF. In fact, General Westmoreland, the U.S. commander in South Vietnam, had no desire yet to go into what he felt were communist sanctuaries in neighboring countries. But what he did want was a much more effective bombing campaign to cut the flow of supplies and men to the guerrillas. If that happened, Westmoreland was confident he could win. He would need more troops but once he had built up his forces, he was sure he could seize the initiative. The leaders of the National Liberation Front were rarely able to meet. They were forced to gather in the strictest secrecy at a remote forest area near the Cambodian border. The fear was that a single American bombing raid could wipe out the leadership at a stroke. Security was intense, and avoiding enemy units meant that some members had to travel for weeks to reach the conference. The Central Committee had 52 members and was led by the chairman, Nguyen Hu To. To was a French educated lawyer and to many in South Vietnam, the acceptable moderate face of the Viet Cong. But behind To were lifelong communists like the general secretary, Huan Tan Phat, an architect and the NLF's foremost thinker. Another hardliner was the French educated lawyer, Tran Bu Kim, one of the NLF's founders. By now, Northerners were in almost full control of the military command, and through them, North Vietnam was making sure its policies were followed. The NLF guerrilla army was even more closely controlled by the North. Its top commander was a North Vietnamese army general, Nguyen Chi Tan. Tan was noted as a political firebrand, and wanted to stay on the offensive, whatever the cost or the dangers. Tan was equal in rank to the North Vietnamese Defense Minister, General Jap, who favored a more cautious approach in the South, now that American firepower had entered the equation. By the end of 1965, Jap was winning the argument. The result would soon be felt on the battlefields of South Vietnam. <laughs> 
American combat troops had first arrived in Vietnam, few U.S. officials had believed that the South could survive. By the end of 1965, the picture had changed dramatically. The new government, led by Air Marshal Key, was growing in confidence. The arrival of American troops had given morale a huge boost, and there was no longer a danger that the communists could win quickly. For General Westmoreland, the next stage was to go on the offensive against the Viet Cong. His aim was to take on the enemy's big formations on the battlefield and eliminate them one by one. The tactics would be those of search and destroy, finding and trapping the enemy, then smashing his forces with massive firepower. General Westmoreland's strategy would be to wear the Viet Cong down by relentless attrition. In battle after battle, Westmoreland meant to force the Viet Cong to sacrifice troops and materials faster than they could ever be replaced. The measure of success would be the amount of supplies destroyed, the number of bases knocked out, and above all, the body count, the number of enemy soldiers actually killed in battle. For defense, four national priority areas were agreed by the Americans and the South Vietnamese. The coastal provinces around Da Nang and Ki Non, and the central part of the Mekong Delta, and above all, Saigon, the capital. These were to be first consolidated and then made the springboards for large-scale search and destroy operations against enemy units and base areas. The greatest Viet Cong concentrations in the whole of South Vietnam were known to lie between the capital and the Cambodian border. Through this area ran several strategic roads and the river routes into the capital. There were believed to be enemy bases in the Iron Triangle, War Zone C and War Zone D. These base areas were the destination for most of the supplies and men that came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and it was these bases the Americans would have to attack if the Viet Cong were to be finally defeated. A key part of the American strategy was to stop the Viet Cong, replacing the men and supplies they lost in battle. The Commando Hunt bombing campaign was hitting the North Vietnamese transport system and the staging areas for troops infiltrating down to the south. During 1965, U.S. aircraft had flown 55,000 individual sorties over the north. In the South itself, the Americans meant to take over most of the fighting. The U.S. forces were better armed and trained than South Vietnamese government troops. They were much more mobile and had the backing of enormous firepower. Meanwhile, to the intense frustration of many South Vietnamese army commanders, 
government forces would deal mainly with local security. Only elite units would take part in offensive operations. In December 1965, Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese leadership ordered a change in the way the war in the South was to be fought. From now on, the Viet Cong would avoid pitched battles with the Americans unless the odds were clearly in their favor. There would be more hit and run attacks and ambushes. To counter the American buildup, Viet Cong recruitment would be stepped up and more North Vietnamese army troops would be infiltrated into South Vietnam. The Vietnamese communists, following the example of Chinese guerrillas before them, had always given the highest priority to creating safe base areas. They were training grounds, logistics centers, and headquarters. They also offered secure sanctuaries for times when the war might go badly. Hiding the base areas had always been a high priority for the Viet Cong. Now, with American spotter planes everywhere, it was more vital than ever to protect them. In remote swamps or forests, there were few problems, but nearer the capital, it was much more difficult. The answer was to build enormous warrens of underground tunnels. The biggest were in the Iron Triangle, and in the Ku Chi district, only 20 miles from Saigon. In the Ku Chi base area, any facility used by the guerrillas, like a conference room or training area, had almost instant access to the safety of underground. Hidden trapdoors led below, past guarded chambers to long passages. At regular intervals, branches led back to the surface and other secret entrances. Some openings were even concealed beneath the waters of streams or canals. At the deeper levels, there were chambers carved out for arms factories and a well for the base's water supply. There were storerooms for weapons and rice, and there was sometimes a hospital or forward aid station. Long communication tunnels connected the base with other distant complexes. Base kitchens were always near the surface, with long carved out chimneys designed to diffuse cooking smoke and release it some distance away. Near the kitchens were the guerrillas' sleeping chambers, where they could survive for weeks at a time if need be. Everywhere on the top level, there were tunnels leading back upwards to hundreds of hidden firing posts for defense of the base. The base area at Ku Chi was a vast network with 200 miles of tunnels. There were other complexes too, big and small, scattered all over the country. Each villager in an NLF area had to dig a meter of tunnel a day. 
There was even a standard handbook specifying exactly how tunnels were to be built. The orders coming from NLF headquarters were absolutely clear. Tunnels were not to be treated as mere shelters. They were to be fighting bases, able to provide continuous support for troops. Even if the village was in enemy hands, the NLF beneath should still be fully capable of offensive operations. When Washington had decided to send American troops to fight the Viet Cong, the biggest question had been, how many would be needed to win? Military planners accepted that to win a war against guerrillas, an army needed to outnumber them 10 or even 15 to one. But American generals were now arguing that the Viet Cong was no longer a guerrilla force but a conventional army of big units. Because US commanders were confident they were not fighting a guerrilla war, they saw no need for a 10 to one superiority in forces. Against a regular army, three to one was usually considered enough. Four hundred thousand U.S. troops, plus the South Vietnamese Army, would be just sufficient to reach that target. The plan was to have most of the men in Vietnam by the end of 1966. The South Vietnamese Army had divided the country into four tactical zones, with an army corps in each. As American forces arrived, Military Assistance Command headquarters in Saigon assigned them to a corps tactical zone. By the end of 1965, the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force commanded four regiments in I Corps. The 1st Air Cavalry Division was in II Corps along with a brigade of the 101st Airborne. The 1st Infantry Division and the 173rd Airborne were in III Corps. During 1966, the plan was to build up U.S. strength by two Marine regiments, three Army divisions, an armored cavalry regiment, and two light infantry brigades. The combat strength of allied nations would also increase to two Korean divisions and a Marine brigade, an Australian task force, plus New Zealand and Philippine units. By late December 1965, almost 150,000 U.S. troops had arrived in Vietnam. The Air Force had over 500 aircraft at eight bases. The huge scale of the buildup had placed an incredible strain on facilities and installations. There was a frenzy of building as Army and Navy engineers, along with American civilian contractors, improved airfields, bases, and roads. 
most ambitious construction project of all was a gigantic port and logistics base at Kamran Bay. The whole effort was to cost $100 million, but the new facility would quickly ease the pressure on Saigon's overloaded docks. By now, American supplies arriving in Vietnam by sea were topping 300,000 tons a month and rising fast. As the Cold War had produced one world crisis after another, the U.S. armed forces had been on a war footing almost continuously for five years. Budgets were generous, and all the services were superbly well-equipped and trained. Many American officers and NCOs already had combat experience in Vietnam as military advisors. Most of the more senior personnel had fought in World War II and Korea. But for the enlisted men, many of whom were draftees, their training programs rarely prepared them for what was to come. Even to the best trained soldiers, the reality of arriving in Vietnam could come as a shock. The climate was exhausting, with extremes of heat and humidity. The Vietnamese people and their culture were totally unfamiliar. Many American soldiers were from U.S. cities, and the lives of Southeast Asian peasants were beyond anything they knew. But in spite of the strangeness of the world in which they had come to fight, at this stage, morale was high amongst American troops in Vietnam. There was confidence in the Army's leadership, and most units had a strong sense of camaraderie. There was also the knowledge that a soldier's basic tour of duty was a finite 13 months and 14 days. While thousands of Americans were getting their first look at Vietnam, the South Vietnamese Army was in its sixth year of war. Most of the Army's 300,000 soldiers were reluctant conscripts. Many were underfed, and desertions were outstripping recruitment by 2,000 a month. As for the officers, corruption was rife, and many sold their units food and supplies. The most senior commanders had nearly all been appointed for their political and family connections. For years, the basic infantry weapon of the American soldier had been the M14 rifle. It was a dependable weapon, but was unstable when fired on full automatic. The M14 would stay in service with some units for a long time yet. But a new weapon was starting to reach the troops in Vietnam. The M16 was a light, compact assault rifle made of metal alloy and plastic. It was effective up to 400 yards and had a very high rate of fire. <laughs> 
Although on paper the M16 seemed to offer the infantryman everything he could wish for in a rifle, the reality was very different on the battlefield. The M16 was prone to jamming, a nightmare for the soldier in a firefight. The problem was reduced by scrupulous cleaning, and later modifications would cure the problem completely. But in the meantime, many men viewed the M16 with deep mistrust. In an American infantry platoon, the most valued weapon of all was the M60 machine gun. The M60 could fire more than 100 rounds a minute and had a range of 1,000 yards. The gun was usually operated by a two-man crew, but it could also be fired from the hip. The M60 was extremely robust and well suited to the harsh conditions of battle in Vietnam. As well as the weapons they took with them into the field, American infantry could call on heavy fire support at any time. Ground attack aircraft could saturate the area with high explosives or napalm while few operations were ever mounted out of range of friendly artillery. Unlike aircraft, guns were not affected by weather or visibility, and they were extremely accurate. The biggest American artillery pieces, the 175 millimeter howitzers, could destroy a target at a range of 20 miles. By now, every infantry division depended heavily on helicopters to maneuver its forces on the battlefield and to carry supplies and heavy equipment. For the Army, the basic infantry transport helicopter was the UH-1 Huey. The men called it a slick because its frame was uncluttered by guns or rockets. The Huey was able to carry 11 soldiers and their equipment. For protection, each helicopter had a door gunner with an M60. As well as Hueys for transporting infantry and general supplies, there were Huey gunships for escort and assault. The gunships were armed with a formidable array of rockets, machine guns, and grenade launchers. By the end of 1965, the total strength of the NLF and North Vietnamese Army units in the South had grown to 206,000 men and women. Of these, 36,000 were main force NVA troops. The rest were regional and local guerrillas. The main force Viet Cong units were used to launch large-scale offensives over a wide area. They were uniformed, full-time soldiers. Regional forces were also full-time, but they operated inside their own districts. If necessary, their units could come together to make bigger formations for a large-scale attack. If enemy pressure became too great, they could break again down into smaller units and scatter. <laughs> 
As for the local guerrillas based in the villages, their main job was political. They were a constant reminder of the armed presence of the Viet Cong and worked to increase local support. They were also expected to defend nearby installations like bunkers and tunnel complexes. Viet Cong forces were commanded by the Central Office for South Vietnam, near the Cambodian border. The NLF deployed two divisions, the 9th with three regiments and the 5th with two. Four more regiments were independent main force units. The NLF also controlled more than 40 local and regional battalions. Further north, all communist operations were run by the North Vietnamese Army. The NVA deployed three divisions and nine independent regiments. In 1965, American aircraft made tens of thousands of bombing attacks against the Ho Chi Minh supply trail and on logistic centers in North Vietnam. In spite of their efforts, the Viet Cong were getting more weapons and reinforcements from the North than ever before. The average Viet Cong unit was now better armed than at any time in the movement's history. Although the guerrillas depended on the Ho Chi Minh Trail for arms, ammunition, and special equipment, 21 tons a day was enough to keep them fighting. Their other needs were met inside South Vietnam. To feed the troops, rice taxes were imposed on farmers, and every possible local resource was used and reused. Nothing was wasted. Even the American supplies and containers left behind on the battlefield were put to some military purpose. In the last 12 months, the Viet Cong had suffered terrible losses. 40,000 had been killed or captured in 1965. Yet the casualties had little effect on Viet Cong fighting strength. Losses in main force units were easily made up from the ranks of the local guerrillas. The biggest problem was the high casualty rate among officers. To replace these, the Viet Cong depended on trained men coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail from the north. One in 10 Viet Cong were now northern, and the Viet Cong was increasingly run by the northerners right down to the village level. By this time, most Viet Cong main force soldiers had fought for years and were highly skilled and motivated. Every attack was planned down to the last detail using elaborate models and endless rehearsals. The troops were well trained in infantry tactics and night operations. They were also masters of camouflage. <laughs> 
While main force troops thought of themselves as professional soldiers, local Viet Cong were far less confident. Mostly, the recruits were young teenagers, and while many were motivated by idealism, others had been pressured or shamed into joining. What many had in common were real doubts about their ability to fight heavily armed and well-trained American soldiers. Most main force Viet Cong troops were now armed with a superb assault rifle. The AK-47 was a Russian design copied by the Chinese. It was comparable to the American M-16, but it had fewer moving parts. The stock was wood, not plastic, and was far more reliable in Vietnam's testing conditions. The AK-47 also had the advantage of a 30-round magazine compared to the 20 of the American rifle. The Viet Cong had a range of effective Soviet and Chinese light and medium machine guns. They also had heavy machine guns, though never enough. The bigger weapons were especially valued for defense against American helicopters. For destroying armored vehicles or bunkers, the Viet Cong had highly effective rocket-propelled grenades and recoilless rifles. Mortars were also available in large numbers and had the advantage of being very easy to transport. Many weapons, including booby traps and mines, were homemade in the villages. The materials ranged from scavenged tin cans to discarded wire, but the most important ingredients were provided by the enemy. In a year, dud American bombs could leave more than 20,000 tons of explosives scattered around the Vietnamese countryside. After air raids, volunteers retrieved the duds and the dangerous business of creating a new weapon began. In 1966, locally made devices would kill more than a thousand American soldiers. For General Westmoreland, the close of 1965 marked the end of the defensive stage of the American War in Vietnam. In the coming year, he meant to complete his buildup. Then he would launch the full-scale offensives that would lead to final victory. The key to Westmoreland's strategy was that communist main force units would be destroyed in set-piece battles by concentrated American firepower. Westmoreland was confident the Viet Cong would stand and fight. But there were some signs that the Viet Cong might be changing their tactics. In the last weeks of 1965, the Viet Cong concentrated their attacks on poorly defended targets, like isolated outposts and remote towns. Strong South Vietnamese or American forces were making contact with big guerrilla units less and less often. At the same time, there were more sniping incidents and ambushes. As a result, 
While Viet Cong casualties went down, American and South Vietnamese army losses increased dramatically. There was even more disturbing news in store for American commanders as 1965 came to a close. Washington's Defense Intelligence Agency reported that the Rolling Thunder bombing campaign against North Vietnam was failing. After 10 months of increasingly fierce air attacks, the North showed no signs it was about to give up its support for the Viet Cong. Nor had the bombing staunched the flow of men and supplies to the guerrillas. That meant only one thing. The real contest was still to come on the battlefields of South Vietnam.